Today's episode of the Stallside Podcast was brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. How are you doing today, Bart? Good afternoon, sir. Doing very well. Yeah, I'm doing very well too. Thank you for asking. So, yeah, we've got uh, Dr. Al Ruggles on the show today. Al Ruggles, you know, he and I came to Root and Riddle about the same time and obviously he had a lot more experience, but he's, uh, I'm excited about today because there are a few people in the orthopedic world that can do the things that Al can do. Yeah, Al is quietly understated. I mean, he, you know, he's involved in a lot of the um, training, he's involved he in a lot of the advances, but he doesn't toot his own horn. No. But he would be, um, well, I've seen one of the best orthopedic surgeons I've seen. I mean, there's he's very creative with his approaches, and he knows, knows a lot of medicine as well. I mean, Al looks at the animal holistically, and how do we get to the best possible result? Even though it's an orthopedic thing, he's thinking about the entire patient, and those are rare skills. Yeah, and he's he, there's there's very few things that you can take to him that he hasn't seen before, or if he hasn't seen it, he's he, you know he's got an already formulating an, an idea of how to fix things. Yeah, and on stall side this week, we're talking to Dr. Al Ruggles, surgeon here at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital, and he's going to talk about his approach to fracture repair in the equine limb. <laughs> Dr. Ruggles, welcome to stall side. Well, thanks, Peter. Yep, Glad thank you. Here. Thanks for being with us. Sure, Bart. So, Al, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I don't know where to start. I was, I grew up near Belmont park. That's, that's how I got involved in horses. Uh, I was a groom. I was a hot walker first, um, snuck on the racetrack. You know, it's a catch 22. You can't get on the track unless you have a license, but you can't get a license unless you have a job. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of sneak on there and, uh, snuck through gate six and me and my buddy and, uh, got jobs at different places. I was lucky enough to work for a trainer named Dick Destasio, um, who, I was just, it was just a great guy. And, um, you know, he, he wasn't, I don't think he ever, he was a jockey. I don't think he ever went to, uh, you know, higher education, but he was a smart dude mm -hmm. and, um, he, he learned a lot there. And then he became, um, uh, president of the New York horsemen's, uh, uh, benevolent protection association, the HBPA. And that was right when I was starting in, um, vet school and, I, and he was able to finagle a scholarship for a veterinary student which i think still exists at cornell and so i was i got aid to go through vet school which was great and i worked at the track for uh as a vet's assistant till i was i guess a senior in vet school and um decided i wanted to stay involved in racing but i didn't want to work on the racetrack per se and then fortunately went to uh so i went to school at cornell university for vet school and undergrad and then i was able to go to New Bolton Center for five years to do an internship and residency, and I stayed on a year as a lecturer, um, finished my residency, got board certified, and then I got a job at Ohio State University ostensibly because Dean Richardson, who trained me at um, Penn, I think turned him down because I think you probably used it as a maneuver to get a better <laughs> raise at New Bolton Center, and you you were there, so you understand. That's the game. And, and then Dean recommended me there, so you know you get helped all along the way. And I was at um, OSU for seven years, and then got recruited here through my work, um, the AO course, which is an internal fixation course with Larry. And then I've been here since '99, I guess. So, how old were you when you were sneaking on the racetrack? I think I was 16 or yeah. something like that. I can't remember. I might have been a little So you older. worked there for a few years then? Yeah, I worked there at least five or six years and um, then worked in the summers and breaks when I was in, in vet school. So until, like, when you know how it is when you become a junior, then I worked all summer and in the, in, in the, we had a clinic crew um, when the students weren't there. And then so that I stopped doing it then. But it was fun. I, I, I grew up on the racetrack. I really loved it. Yeah, you'd have a unique perspective then because you would have seen both sides of it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, um, you know, you, you kind of live uh, uh, vicariously in sports through through racehorses. And, um, but I've, I, yeah, I, I've seen both sides of it. And, you know, you learn what side of the pitchfork to pick up. And, you know, those are important <laughs> things to learn in life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what would you like to talk about today? Well, you, you know, one of the things I think we don't do a very um, great job as, as a profession. Um, is really talk about all the good things that we can do um, in fracture repair. And, and you've all been in a number, you know, at, at parties and, and family events, and everyone asks you, well, if a horse breaks its leg, you have to euthanize them. And, you know, it drives me crazy because that's what I do is fix them. Well, you've yeah. probably seen the far side cartoon sure i i hate that uh, uh yeah we're, oh, we're, we're, about that. Uh, Emily, yeah we'll put Emily. it on the screen for you 
<laughs> Emily uh, cruises through equine surgery or That's something, right? right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and it, and it's a uh, um, you know I understand why the public perceives that um, you know when you have um, major televised events and if you have a major problem, then that's sort of their interaction with the sport, and so they don't get to see. Um, you know, those are the most dramatic injuries. They don't get to see all the other things. And, and you guys, you know, we all know that, um, you know, horses do get injured just like people do and they get injured in the field and they, all right. kinds of things happen, you know, and, you know, the whole you know, profession is aimed at trying to, you know, help these horses when they're injured and obviously prevent it. Yeah, no, we see, we see them on the farm. Horses running around, like you said, in the field, and they, they get fractures, same type of thing. Yeah. But there are some limitations. There's some, there's some differences that, that justify a little bit of it because they're massive animals. Sure. And, and they've, got to, they've got to stand on all four legs. Absolutely. So there's like certain tenets, you know, like the credo of a equine orthopedic is, uh, is comfort and comfort. Stability gives you comfort, and once you're stable and comfortable, then you, usually you can win. And mm -hmm. so they're... You know, hopefully when we're done, we'll, you know, present some cases and show some dramatic things that um, I'm pretty sure every case I'm showing, it, it, it did well. I'm not going to show bad cases, mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, there'll be some dramatic fractures. And so people can, you know, if they see it on uh, YouTube or listen, at least they can understand that there's lots of stuff we can do. So talking about fracture repair, what's, what are the things you're looking for that set you up for success? And what are your sort of basic tenets of approaching um, a, a fracture or an equine limb? Sure. So, so there's, there's, you know, the, there's the specific things about the fracture, like what it, what it's, what the biomechanics are. So what's the character of the fracture? Um, is it a long oblique fracture, which gives the opportunity to put a lot of screws across it to provide like inner digitation or what we call reduced shear stress. And then you augment that with other things like plates, uh, which counteract the other forces. Um, what's the soft tissue, um, uh, component. So what I mean by that is how, you know, how much swelling there is, is, has the fracture uh, bone, has the bone, fracture bone penetrated the skin, which is what we call an open fracture or what people in common parlance would say compound. Um, has the blood supply been interrupted? So, you know, we go from hairline fractures that like your kid might have had um, where you just rest them, right? Or you can have something so dramatic like Alex Smith had in you know, the quarterback for, for Washington where his tibia was open and went into this, you know, the, the football field, right? And so the same thing happens in, in not just horses. It happens in people. It happens in dogs and cats. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, trauma is trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kind of things we look for. And so when we assess the, the injury, my what goes through my brain is how can I stabilize this bone so the horse is comfortable? How can I stabilize it, make it, anatomically correct right because you can't especially a growing animal um or any animal you don't want to misalignment because that causes all kinds of issues um how can we preserve the blood supply how can we do this in a a non a way that we don't get an infection uh, which actually doesn't happen that often but if it happens it's it's it's, it's important um and uh you know what's our outcome and, and, and you know you have to be honest with the client they, they always want to know about you know, uh, quality of life, and they want to know about athletic function. So the bar for equine surgeons is different than, you know, for s physicians, and it's different for dog and cat surgeons. Because if I my if my golden retriever has a hip replacement and he can jump on the bed, I'm happy, right? But if my horse is really sound, but it's a second slower, it's different. You know, at least in the competitive in, in the race in the race breeds now. That doesn't mean that it's not a success, and that doesn't mean people won't accept that. And and there's lots of clients that you you do surgery and they find alternate careers if it's the horse isn't going to be as fast. And obviously, we don't just operate on thoroughbreds. We do the you know there's all kinds of disciplines: quarter horses, saddlebreds. I mean, you name it. You know, I think in our clinic maybe 150 different breeds come in or something yep. something yep. like that. I mean, so you know they all they all get something. Mm -hmm. So so. Um, you, you want to talk about some uh, some cases now. So would you like to walk us through them? Sure. So if, um, I don't know if we have that on the um, video or not, or the, sorry, the screen. So this this first slide is our, our four different horses, and they all have fairly dramatic injuries. The, the first one is, a, is an inventor that uh, we're looking at. It's um, 
at its radius. So this is the carpus, which we would call our wrist. Um, and so this is the, the what we call the radio carpal joint. You see he's pulled off a piece of bone here where the, the ligament that holds the inside of the knee is attached. That's called an avulsion fracture. Um, so this is an event, or it happens to be a thoroughbred, but he injured uh, eventing. This is a quarter horse foal that's a young foal, like two months of age. And you can see has this, this is the metacarpus, which is the bone below the knee. Um, and you can see this multi-piece fracture. Um, the skin is, the soft tissue is swollen. That's what that cloudy uh, look is, but we didn't have a puncture of the, um, uh, through the skin. This is an adult horse with a radial fracture. So that's the bone above the knee. And this is an adult horse with a dislocated um, hock, uh, which would be our ankle. Uh, so these are all really in, important injuries. Um, they are, have different challenges. The, the first one, uh, we, we need to reconstruct the joint appropriately and then counteract this uh, force of the collateral ligament. Obviously, with this foal, we have to realign everything and, and figure out a way to counteract the forces of weight bearing and rotation. Um, adult horse with this 1100 pound horse and we were, we're fixing a major bone um, for weight bearing. And this is a big challenge. And then um, this fracture is unusual or this dislocation is unusual, but we have a good way to, um, to deal with those. And I can tell you all of these horses survived and here are the repairs. So wow. uh, we use a variety of different techniques. So for instance, in the event horse, we place screws to compress the fracture. So these screws glide through this portion of bone here and engage the other portion of bone, just like you would if you were doing woodworking. And my mother was a registered nurse, and she always said that orthopedic surgeons were glorified carpenters. So uh, <laughs> that's where I got this from. But um, and then, but we have to counteract the ligament that's pulling here, and that's why this additional fixation. So we have wires attached. Uh, we have another screw here that we have some wires that are going to help prevent this from loosening. And you might see other thing that's a little odd here, washers. And those washers are there to keep this wires from pulling over the screw heads, mm -hmm. right? So a little bit different. This foal, what we did here, you can see I had to throw away some of the, you know, it's never a good idea to leave some of the horse on the operating table, but these pieces couldn't be um, salvaged and they lost their blood supply. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, anyway, so we used a, a, a double plating technique. And if you think about like when you're, putting a house up or building anything, one wall is not very strong, but as soon as you have a corner, it, it improves your, your ability to counteract the forces. And we have forces, like I said, weight bearing. So we have tension on one side, bending on the other side. We have torsional loads as well, or twisting loads. And so using a combination of plating and different strategic screws, and um, we'll get into the weeds on this, but you can see we have aligned the limb uh, well and used two plates. And eventually these plates come out in an athletic horse. Uh, and they did in this full. Uh, this is an uh, the adult with the radial fracture, and you can see we have to span in both cases the entire bone. Because uh, in horses, if you leave, uh, because they're weight bearing the whole time, if you let, like say you ended the plate like right here where my um, um, <clears throat> where my pointer is, that's a big stress riser. So what happens is you're if you put a piece of metal on a on a board and you want to to snap that board, it would break right where the metal ends. And the same thing happens in horses. So we have to span the entire bone. So the, the smaller the lever arm, if you will, meaning the, the plate goes to the ends, uh, the more protect, the less likely to have that effect. And then this is another adult with a dislocation. And we use the calcaneus, which would be our heel bone. And then we plate down the whole back um, to repair that. And we also, like none of the, the first three cases are just managed in bandages. We woke up this a venter in a what we call a cast bandage so we use some cast material over a bandage and a splint for recovery and then took it off just as a recovery method the foal got up in a bandage the horse gets up and the radial fracture gets up in a bandage because people might say why don't you put a cast on but you have to remember where the radius attaches just below the elbow uh, or sorry it goes up to the elbow you you have to when you use a cast you have to mobilize the joint above and below and you can't immobilize, you can't physically immobilize the elbow of a horse based on the, how the muscle attaches, unlike mm -hmm. us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this horse, um, the horse with the um, a dislocated hock, because we could get up to the top of the tibia, we managed him in cast. So these are all dramatic injuries that, you know, and it's not, it's not here to say, you know, I'm the only one that does this. There's lots of people that do this, right? But people think, well, once they have these fractures, there's no chance. And 
And as I said, all, all four of these horses are alive, and these aren't the only four that we've treated successfully. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee that. Like, like bone's incredibly strong. And looking at those fracture pairs you have, you've got like plates and screws. Talk about the materials that are used because um, weight for weight, like bone is stronger than a lot oh, of metal. Yeah, yeah. So, so what are the materials you use and the placement of the screws and what's special about those screws to allow them to hold those plates on? Right. So so the implants are medical grade implants. They're, they're, um, they're made from uh, 316L um low carbon steel so they don't they don't have they don't undergo this deterioration or passivity um so there's very special type of um of steel the um they're all the same metal so you don't want to use two different metals because you'll create a battery mm -hmm. um if you in, an, in a salt solution which is how we live um the other type of materials that are used are, ti are titanium um and 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 we get the that's commonly used in, in people because they are a little more flexible, so they're less strong, and they have uh, an inherently lower risk of infection. Um, but, and it's funny, a lot of times when you look work with um, a physician's horse, they wonder, wonder why we don't use titanium because that's what they use in people, and the, the answer is always the same. I say, well, because steel is stronger, and they say, no, it isn't. And I said, well, actually, it is, and... I, I'm sorry, you do neurolo neurology or something. I, I can't help that you don't know that steel's stronger than titanium, at least right. in the way it's manufactured here, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, the and I'm not insulting physicians. I'm just pointing out that some, hey, sometimes we have to to each their own. Yeah, we have right? to. We have to. Uh, we I, I work in, in the AO group, uh, the vets part of it, and then we have trauma surgeons and, and cranial maxillofacial surgeons, spine surgeons. So we banter all the time. So I'm not particularly worried about it, but. Um, and then the screws, you, you know, when you put a screw in, you drill it, it's drilled precisely um, to the, the, the shaft size. And then you make it, use a tap like you would in metal to make sure the thread profile is exactly like the thread profile on the screw. And if you want to, like, if you look at, at this repair, for instance, you can see there's a couple different types of screws. These screws look a little bigger. They look like machine screws, if you will, whereas these screws look like more like uh, lag screws. Mm -hmm. So these are cortex screws and these other ones are locking screws. And these locking screws will actually also have threads on the heads and they lock in the plate. So they are very, very, there's called a fixed angle um, system and they're very, very stable. And that's been around for about the last 15 years. Um, and the, these are, um, it, these are manufactured by a company that manufactures uh, you know, human products as well. These are vet products, so they're labeled vet, and they can't be used in people, even though they're exactly the same. With the exception at the bottom of the plate, you can see we have a round hole here because mm -hmm. we are always dealing by growth plates, and that makes it keeps the this little snowplow effect, if you see here, um, away from the joints, etc. So this is a vet feature of this of this particular type mm -hmm. of uh, implant. Mm -hmm. And there's other ones too, but you can use wires for different things. You can see wires metal strong as long as you're not bending it. Mm -hmm. you're pulling it it's pretty damn strong so a cable um you know a suspension bridge right that's how that works and that's sort of why we're what we're doing here with that even though this is a like an 1100 1200 pound horse um the um, um aventer we use pr pretty weak implants because we took care of, we took account of the biomechanics that's fascinating stuff and the angle those screws are going through looking at those radiographs i mean they're not all in the same plane yeah, you have to, you place strategic screws and then you, um, because you have to have them in a certain place. So like if you're double plating, I might put four screws in each plate, you know, um, and I, what I almost always do is put two screws in, in, in one plate and then the other plate. And I take a radiograph and make sure that it looks like what I have in my brain, right? So I'm visualizing what it should look like. And mm -hmm. then I pr confirm it. And if it's not right, and it's easy, like in a fold to get the, if you don't have them perfect, then the plate might come off the side. So you have to, you know, you know sometimes you have to change things, but there's no dishonor in taking a radiograph and making it better. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the dishonor is not doing it right. Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, every time you do something, it's potentially going to change the alignment you thought you had. Right, exactly. Once you have it fixed, then you're, we call it, it's kind of plug and chug. You just, you know, try to avoid it. And you, and you have to, you know, line it up so you're not hitting the other screws, but that's fine when if you did like a, you know, a perfect cylinder, but then you're bending the plate because it's not a perfect cylinder. So that's changing the angle. So there's sort you know, there's a lot of things that happen. And sometimes you, th you have good plan and poor execution. <laughs> like, like some of the screws don't go where you want. You just yeah. have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen an injury quite like that Hawk injury. Yeah. 
That is unusual. Yeah, they're not the tarsal, plantar tarsal instability. They, um, the most common way they happen is in cattle because someone will be on a farm and they'll be with their pickup truck and they'll like try to move the cattle and they'll bump kick, into them. you know. But um, yeah, we see that, you know, I don't, I've probably done five of those. Okay. Um, and then you can do that same repair. It's the same repair we do with elbows. Um, it just happens to be in, in the hind leg. And um, calcaneal fractures will do that. We'll do the same thing as well. So. Hmm. Okay, and you have some other cases. Yeah, for us. so like some of the more simple things. So I, I wanted to show that just as a kind of a you know a kind of maybe a, hey wow look at this, but these are the simpler fractures to start with. So this is a, um, a thoroughbred racehorse, and you can see the fracture line here. Um, what we what this horse if in fact had was it came down and it actually turned into a Y. So it's a very significant injury. We figured that out on a computer tomography exam prior to surgery went ahead and put these screws in what we call lag fashion meaning they glide through the the fracture portion of bone and engage the parent portion of bone and then maintain him in a cast for about 30 days he went back and, and raced uh, you can see the callus down here in the center slide and you look at this screw and you're like oh my god he put it right in the joint but you can see mm -hmm. when you look at the other view you can tell because mm -hmm. this thing's like a triangle right so you, you need to have three-dimensional thinking and before computer tomography was common in horses and before we got one i'm kind of glad i got trained without it because my brain thinks it, it you know i can i can hopefully see three-dimensionally when i look at the leg because i've had to do it my whole life and then when you get it confirmed with a ct then you're i think it just enhances your mm -hmm. ability to do something so that would be relatively um this is a, the first failing sorry just below the fetlock joint um this is probably the most common fracture we fix. This happens to be racehorse as well. We don't see them much in other breeds, but we see them in standard breeds as well, thoroughbred racehorses. And this is a condylar fracture. The condyle is this portion of the metacarpus. Again, this fetlock joint. And you can see it's cracked up. Uh, this is on the outside. Uh, it's non-displaced, which is really important. That means that the joint surface is relatively um, you know, unperturbed. Um, and so our job here is to simply compress it with a with a forcep and then place these two screws to to help maintain it in reduction and get and you can see the post op is you know you can't even see the line this happened the day before um, these do very well um, with non displaced fractures uh, upwards of eighty percent of them return to the normal function um, so the, and there's lots of different types of condylar fractures but this would be uh, the most common one we treat. And this is the same type of fracture, but you can see the difference here. This is one from three weeks ago. It broke out, so it's a complete fracture. And even though it's smaller, it's way more important because I, we need to put this properly together. And we're also going to have a little bit of a defect down here because when they break out into the joint, they get a little bit of a Y almost always that you have to pluck out. Um, you can't see that on x-ray, but this is the post-op the next day. And we, we do this arthroscopically, so we put a the arthroscope in the joint to identify the you know so we can properly reduce it we can see it take out any loose pieces confirm it when uh, prior to putting the screws in and and you can see we use it, one screw is a little bit bigger this is a 5.5 .5 diameter this is a 4.5 because there's a little r more risk of bending here so we try to use metal as uh, to the third um, power as far as the um, uh, its strength so if if we have a greater diameter it's going to be um, less resistant to bending so um, so that's a would be the most common. The, in foals, this might be our most common fracture. So this is one of Bart's clients, um, oh. and um, this foal suffered. And you look at this, and you go, "Oh my God! Like what? Have he broke here? He broke here? He broke here? Well, those are all growth plates. So that's all normal. So if you you're not sure, and this is a growth plate too. If you're not sure what's normal, take the other X-ray the other side, right? But uh, fortunately, I do know what's normal, so I didn't have to do that at least on this one. Um, and so this, in fact, is the fracture, and it's it looks like it's kind of two different fracture lines. It's just one fracture line, but it's oblique, so they're kind of sliding over each other, if you will. And so our goal here is to anatomically reduce this because the joint's right here, and then counteract the force of the triceps, which essentially, so this is the elbow. And so when we put a plate on, when that elbow contracts, it pulls here, puts force, pulls here, puts force through, the plate and that's called a tension band principle it's like a hinge and then it compresses the joint so it actually the, the force mm -hmm. of the triceps is actually helpful 
mm-hmm. this point. And this is a, these are uh, like the next day or something because the staples are still in. Um, and this is the one that I think Bart never took the staples out and I had to take them out as I remember. Uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty true. I was yeah. at the farm, Meg. When are they supposed to take them out? Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, <laughs> that, would you like some aloe for that, Ben? <laughs> that's just a joke. Anyway, uh, and so we want to, we have to line it up down the back. I mean, you know, it's, you take, and so in this repair, once we have it reduced, I'll put two screws in and I'll take an x-ray and make sure, okay, I got this plate where I want to at the top of the bone. I'm not getting in the, I, I can't connect the ulna to the radius in a growing animal because this growth plate, if, if I did that, it's going to pull the ulna with it because it grows that direction. So you get subluxation, which is a bit, bad deal. And you can see the joint here and we reduced it really well and it's folded really well. Um, when we leave those plates in, um, in general, they don't need to come out. Sometimes they get removed, but and if for the horse's sake, we don't have to take them out. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that really, looking at that elbow especially, that really emphasizes you've got to know your anatomy. You've got to have really high quality imaging. And sort of what you alluded to before about some of the forces, you really have to have um, uh, skill with anesthesia to make this together. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, in the, the evolution of fracture repair is, is dramatic and, and it has goes part and parcel with our ability to anesthetize horses safely. There's no doubt about it, you know. And, uh, you know, I'll show a horse later that had a had an injury where the injured bull says more. It's a racing injury. It's a sig- significant injury that prevents him from racing again. But that's the same injury Ruffian had. And Ruffian was a horse that raced in 76, and she uh, tragically got injured match race with uh, foolish pleasure at Belmont Park. And um, she wound up uh, being managed, but without the type of techniques we use today. And, and so she's she's actually buried under the at the flagpole at, uh, at Belmont Park. Um, she was a you – know, I was a lot uh, – I mean, I remember this. And uh, that fracture today, we fixed 70, 75% of them mm. survive. And that's a Dr. Bramlage's technique of fetlock arthrodesis, but I'll show that yeah. in a little bit. And this is, a, so this is another elbow. This is an adult horse. And you can see this has got a little more energy into it. Um, and so, because they're bigger, and I'm not sure how this happened. This happened to be a quarter horse. And you can see there's multiple pieces here. He's broken out the cortex at the back, and there's also um, pieces here. And this makes it harder because we have defects present. We have to then use not just the single plate because now we have maybe bone missing. And so we might have instability side to side. And that's where this uh, secondary plate comes in to to help that. So we we do the standard repair. We can use the radius because this animal is mature. So he's not growing anymore. So we can get more purchase in the bone. And then we take the secondary plate. We don't have to fill all the holes there. It's really there to kind of hold it from getting uh, cattywampus side to side. And here's the side, back view. So here's a plate down the back, and here's the plate down the down the outside over the lateral side. And um, anyway, so that's uh, and he was a uh, he had an open fracture, meaning there was a uh, oh, the wound had had gone down to the bone, but unfortunately didn't get infected. So we did some special stuff with him to uh, try to prevent that. Unfortunately, we did. So. Mm-hmm. And these, ho- these horses are immediately weight-bearing, so they walk back to their stall as soon as they recover. So maybe he's, he's in the recovery stall an hour, an hour and a half, because this is a long surgery. It probably took like two and a half hours total. Um, so they get up and they walk back, and they have to walk back. We, you know, we, we don't have a choice. We can ask them to lay down. Um, doesn't work. Doesn't, yeah, they I don't mean, tend, I ask them all the time. <laughs> they don't tend to negotiate. But yeah. also, if this was a person with this type of injury, they'd potentially be wheeled around and they would actually have bed rest and not be told to keep off the limb. But as you say, you can't reason with the horse. Well, we had, we had an intern that got kicked uh, in the elbow. It was the same day I fixed an elbow. This is many, many years ago. And they played it with a smaller plate, but it's, it's exactly the same technique. The foal, of course, or the weanling walked back to the stall. And then um, our intern was told you couldn't pick up anything um, heavier than a pencil for six weeks. Mm. <laughs> I was. Those were the orders. So... <laughs> I mean, I think they might have been a, a little wimpy with the repair then, you know, but that, yeah. that's, that's, mm-hmm. the, that's the beauty that they have in people is, that, is you can not make them non-weight-bearing. Um, and it was, a, you know, the, you know our, our horses are like doing hamstr- handstrings, springs on their, on their legs. Well, and, yep. and, and not only that, that, they're laying down when you fix this, and they've got to get yeah, up. They've got to get a, up. That's a huge right. amount of force. Yeah, and, and then, like, the elbows, you, when we bandage them, we use a different type of bandaging, but you – 
often put a combination of Vaseline and cayenne pepper over the folds. And I, when I talked to my physician friends and showed these cases, I said, it's just like what you guys do. You put that, that cayenne pepper on the bandage so your patients don't chew their incision. They're like, what? I, I mean, you know, so yeah. we have they, we have things we have to deal with. Right? Right. Or, or yeah. just yeah, you, know, to, yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, here's a, um, this is a pastor and orthodesis. So this is a quarter horse with a, um, a, um, it had a fracture. You can't, you can't see the fracture of the back of the, of P1, of P2. And this is a standard orthodesis technique where we remove the remaining cartilage. We put a plate down the front. Uh, to compress it and then put these screws that glide through the distal part of P1 and engage proximal P2. The point of that, it's like pulling, it's like a, a, a cable or a car going up the mountain, right? You have a, you're pulling on both sides. So mm-hmm. it's very stable. And uh, this is a very effective technique for horses to, and most of this is done in Western horses in a four limb, about 70 to 75% of them completely return to their discipline, whether it's raining or Western pleasure um, in the hind leg is about 90%. Well, so okay. these 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 are not typically thoroughbred injuries, or and we do, do this is also what we do for ring bone or arthritis of that joint, um, high ring bone, and so. Um, but this is more of a in general, it's more of a Western um, type or quarter horse type thing, or warm bloods. We we do a fair bit of warm bloods as well. So, and are most of those done because of degeneration of the joint or because of injury? Um, in, in my hand and here, I'd say I do about 50, 50. I do a lot of uh, fractures of P2, but they probably come here because we do them. Um, but I would say in general, more horses get done from degenerative joint disease and they may be older, 12 or 13. This is not a joint that tends to fuse on its own. It's not a joint that responds well to medication. Um, the nice thing is once you do this, they're usually back in work at six months and they and I've got more positive, you know, like my horse came back and did great stories with pastor and orthodesis than almost anything else, you know, and, and, you know, win pictures and, mm-hmm. and, you yeah. know, people, I had one client that had, uh, was Dr. Reed's good friend that she had, um, she had a, um, severe cancer and this was like her horse was her therapy and had a, a common to P2 fracture that we fused and she was able to go, she, you know, her last six months of her life, she was able to show that horse, mm-hmm. that, you know, that's, you know, awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's great. It was a uh, Arab that she showed English pleasure. Um, and that horse had a, a injury that was not as bad as this, uh, but s- in, similar. Um, so this is a, this is actually a polo pony, a uh, 19 year old polo pony that they love. And, um, you can see it has a, this, this, this is the same bone we were looking at before, P2, that's P1, that's the fetlock, there's a hind leg. If you look at the side view, you can see it's it's got multiple injuries. So our goal here is to try to kind of get everything together um, to reconstruct it as well as we can. And it's not going to be perfect. We know that we're going to fuse this joint, but our whole goal is what are we, what can we do to reconstruct it that we that we make the pa- the coffin joint happy. Right, and if we do that, because we've already sacrificed this joint, and we know we can do that, and horses be successful. Um, and this is really a salvage procedure. You wouldn't want the client to expect. I tell this is my 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 uh, when I counsel clients, I said you, you, a success to me is that you have a happy horse that you can turn out without medicating. Um, if you're expecting an athlete, you you need to think twice about this. Have I had horses be athletic? Yes, but I would you don't want to count on that. And and people have to go in with with a proper knowledge of what we're doing. Um, and it's their choice. It's not my choice, you know, but I try to give them uh, the best advice. And, you know, obviously you want to be as honest as you can with people and you can't predict things that happen. Um, but this was so significant that even though I was, I was comfortable with how I fixed it, I wasn't, I was a little worried because it was so common to meeting so many pieces. So I, I augmented it with these pins through the cannon bone. So that essentially the weight goes through the cast to the pins bypasses the repair to some level and then we take these pins out at about uh, six to eight weeks so and then keep it in cat and this is the final result for her um it was from last year i think um so it's you know it's, it shows these severe injuries you have an opportunity to make the horse comfortable and to get what the client and this she was a retired horse anyway so they weren't like it wasn't like they had, she had to be athletic but they loved her and they, you know good for them and we're happy to do it obviously um, this is a, this is a full injury. This happens to be a, um, uh, a, a thoroughbred full that we, we see these usually about six to eight weeks of age. And, and this is the stifle joint. 
And this, this is the growth plate of the proximal tibia. And you can see this thing doesn't look quite right. So the fracture comes right here and breaks like this. So this, this whole piece should be like that should be connected there, if that makes sense. And this is the, this is the um, inside of the leg. And, and this is special plate we developed in, uh, in VET, uh, AOVET, which is a locking plate. That's not special, but it's just a generic T plate. Um, and we can get lots of screws in the top. You can see we have three screws in there. Um, right, that the goes a really small piece, and then using the tension band principle we talked about, because the leg is trying to be pulled apart this way, or the or the fracture, and then this is after removal uh, at about six or eight weeks, and this falls sometimes sooner. It's a bigger fold, and this is the there's a the right leg, and that's what the fold looks like at the farm. So we're <clears throat> pretty happy with the outcome; looks pretty normal. And then uh, so so um, uh, yeah, big, and there's nothing here; it's just skin and sub Q. Um, but we fortunately had no uh, no problems and it and healed really well. So um, can be a completely normal um, athletic horse after mm. this. So yeah, that's pretty impressive. You mentioned um, there's not much coverage there, right? So those fractures potentially pretty easy to open up. But does that not much tissue covering? You talked about blood supply before. Does that actually affect the blood supply to the bone, or the bone's happy with its own? The supply? bone in the upper limb is fine because there's. Um, plenty of muscle mm -hmm. attachment it's uh, the bone in the lower limb is the problem we have uh with blood supply the problem we have with this injury sometimes they have it's like opening up an overripe piece of fruit you know and it just the skin just pulls apart and when you close it it's almost like you're closing tissue paper over an implant so i've had um, horses drain i've had these open these incisions but with these fixed angle plates with these screws that don't that don't move um, you can have it, you can look at the plate and it can still heal. And then you did, so I, I had one that it was really dramatic soft tissue injury. I fixed it and the wound like completely dehisced, um, fell apart a week later. Right. I mean, there's nothing I can do. I know how to suture it, but if it's not going to stay together, you can't do anything. So I was looking at that plate. It, it formed granulation tissue. The fracture healed. It was like a big splinter. Take the, cause it doesn't involve the joint. It's just like open. It's like having an open wound on a cannon bone or something, mm -hmm. uh, or even better because it's in the upper limb. As soon as I took the plate out, within like two weeks, the wound was completely closed. It was easy to take the plate out because I could look right at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, the, that's the beauty of these type of plates with these locking screws uh, because they're so stable. Um, you have to you have to have problems the entire length of the screw for it to loosen. So we use these all the time in, in different repairs, mm. but they're they're great. Well, that's actually surprising. You can actually you'd think that you'd have to have that covered over and everything be pristine, but you've just given an example where, yeah, it wasn't the perfect co coverage. It wasn't the perfect closure, and yet you still had a really good result with the bone. Yeah, and, and, and that's one of the things, like, I, I think if you haven't done a lot of these, um, when if you see, like, a wound, if you have a fracture and there's blood, it's like, oh, the horse has no chance, and that's just not true. Like in the cannon bone I showed before, that followed the same problem. That fall that that um, that was like wet tissue paper to suture, and it got a problem. I took the wound up taking the plates out over time, um, but even open fractures of the cannon bone, sixty percent of them were healed. We got to heal with normal techniques. So whereas before, like when you were when I was taught in veterinary school, it was like oh these you know don't even try, mm -hmm. and that's just not true. To, but you know, there's other you know, like if if the hoof has lost its blood supply. Well, I mean that's a whole different thing. But right. just having a wound is not going to uh, kill us. So I have a, a few more cases, but not is that cool to keep going? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. So just some things people need to be aware about. We use different technology for fracture repair, and I'm going to show stuff. Like, this is a dull cannon bone. So this is computed tomography views, and so you can see on this view, which is essentially taking a, a slice from the like the side view of the horse, if you would, if you're slicing it sideways. Um, so here's the can, here's the fetlock joint, here's P1. You can see this fracture coursing up the bone. And then if you look at it transversely straight across, you can see uh, how the fracture kind of wheels around like a barber's pole. So this is really important to know when you're placing screws because you can't always see these on x-rays. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do is put a screw right in that line. That's really bad. Um, so you'd like to go across it or, or in this direction uh, or avoid it, you know, one, one or the other. So so CT is really helpful. So almost all the significant repairs we put in the CT, the CT takes about 10 minutes total. 
And then we will, while they're under anesthesia, we will them in the OR. While they're prepping, I go over the images with and, and figure out what I'm doing and confirming or not confirming what I had in my brain. Um, um, so that's what we do. So here's a similar horse. Um, you can see this fracture. This is a lateral condyl fracture, but it goes up in a really bad way, right? So fortunately, it hasn't fallen apart. This is a two-year-old racehorse. Those arrows show the line. So put them in the CT and go ahead. We put a couple screws at the bottom, just like that other repair to compress mm -hmm. the joint. And then we have to neutralize the forces that I talked about bending in rotation with this plate. So that's a neutralization plate. And in this case, we don't use those locking screws because this bone is so dense that I, that I think there's a risk of splitting the bone. That we, and it folds, it's not a problem. So I use the standard screws that we tap completely. And so here's a post-op, and then this is at, we remove that plate. This was at um, about 90 days, removed this plate. And I got on Memorial Day, I got a, a, a text from the owner, and he sent me the link to the uh, his first race back at Santa Anita, and he won his first race back by like <laughs> six lengths. So this is a front leg. Um, so, so, that, so that's a lot of screws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in a line, you know, and you think about how, when, when, do you worry about weakening the bone from drilling that many holes? No, uh, no, as long as the, the hole is not 30% or more of the trans, uh, cross sectional area of the bone, it's not going to do that. And also, we drill the holes. So, we drill the, these are 4.5 millimeter screws, and there's and the, the shaft diameter is 3.2. So, the holes that are drilled are 3.2. So, they're not that by the, the shaft is not like put, putting radial force on the on the bone except if we didn't tap it so then we tap the the threads at 4.5 millimeter which is the same as the threads yeah. so essentially so they're not doing what you're talking about is radial right. force mm -hmm. um so if you had a, p a piece of granite and you made a hole that was five millimeters and you took a six millimeter pipe or whatever dimension sure. then you'd then and then would break but we're doing the exact same thing and that's why i don't like using those fixed angle screws in these bones because this bone is so dense and those don't get tapped so they're not they're, they're self-tapping we we actually had asked them to make a tap we did our we're in riddle and they made a tap for us so we have one to use in dense bone if we have to use it so but um uh, so then we take these out and these fill in we we always have the horse exercising at least a month in the field before we take the plate out so mm -hmm. it loads the bone around the screws so it doesn't weaken it and we take the plate out and they're usually in until the sutures are out in 10 days and then go back out for a month and then go back to train you know so uh, this is not an unusual uh, repair here's here's a similar one it's a little more dramatic because it's displaced and the idea here, here's the horse walking um the day after surgery so that's kind of what like you can figure out he's not perfect yet um uh, but you know he had a major fracture and a major repair yeah um so he, um, but when you see that kind of comfort, you really feel good about where you're going to be because now we're now he's weight bearing. We're hopefully not going to have problems on the other limbs, such as laminitis, because he's going to uh, a standing up. Like if you look mm -hmm. at his face, you know, I mean, we all know what a happy horse looks like. You know, you'd rather be outside. I realize, but I mean, he's happy to have to be com what a comfortable horse looks like. But th I just I put this slide in not just to show this repair, but to show you what's involved, right? So. You need a team of people. We're doing arthroscopy here. This is this case. Um, so I have to scope the joint to make sure this is aligned before I and get those screws in before I do the rest of it, right? Um, this is just an example of the table, right? So this is orthopedic stuff. There's also another table out, you know, so arthroscopy material, uh, nitrogen hose. Um, sa spent all Saturday afternoon, you know. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's what's involved in doing these. Yeah. So how long do, would a repair like that take? Because um, you talked about quite a few steps you got to go through. Yeah, that. that's this is probably two and a half hours, maybe. So when do you worry about horses? How long they've been down? So it's not like you know. Yeah, you there's no, there's no um, in my in my hands. If I do a orthopedic repair, and under if my time in the OR, like like skin to skin is two hours or less, my risk of infection is really low um, in my life, in my experience. And, you know, you do a lot of other things, right? But, and then as far as general anesthesia goes, uh, the longest one I probably have been involved with is maybe four hours, and that was a, that, those are GI. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole different ball of wax because they're, they're, they, they're sick horses besides having a uh, um, uh, long anesthesia. Are, um, in the past, like in my career, things I have seen that have gone wrong is, is rushing into surgery with an orthopedic 
problem. They're better, we're better off overnighting the horse, getting, letting the horse get rehydrated. We have protective splints. If it's an unstable leg, we can't protect. That's a different story. Horses figure out they're injured. Horses are really smart. Uh, clients are always like, well, he won't be good in the stall. I said, just let, let him go home and, and let's see, because they know, or they, I don't know if they know, they figure out how to survive and they've been around a long time. Um, so they tend to act better than we think they're going to act. Um, as long as you keep their pressure over 60, you can have it below 60. And we measure their arterial dire- pressure directly with a, a line, an A-line in the facial artery. So, and we can adjust that as needed. So I would say if we're getting over three and a half hours of anesthetic time, we're concerned. Uh, but taking them to surgery too quick, make sure, if they're not well hydrated, you have to watch their positioning. So you always look and make sure that they're well positioned. Our techs are really good at that because you get problems with, with either myositis, meaning inflammation of the muscle, or you can have problems with the nerve if the leg's not positioned right. Those things happen infrequently. Uh, poor recoveries. If the horse is relaxed when, when they become, if they're relaxed and everyone's relaxed and there's no loud noise, they tend to get up well. Uh, if it's chaotic and they're excited, they that's how they wake up. So we, we're really careful about that. And uh, so you're always concerned, but you know you want to be quick as long as you're being accurate. You know, so it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, I think what else I got. So that so this is the injury that Ruffian had. So this is a says these are this is a protective splint that's aluminum splint. And you can see that the sesamoid bones here are broken on both sides. So this is a uh, what we call a traumatic disruption of the suspensory apparatus because the suspensory ligaments attach here, and that supports the fetlock. And this, this is what's called a fetlock arthrodesis. So what we've done is remove the cartilage and fuse this joint. Uh, we have to grab the bottom of these sesamoid bones. We reconstruct the back of the joint with these wires and use that locking plate again. Um, and this is a, a way to – And these horses usually are in a cast for about a month. Uh, they usually start going out again about four months, um, and barring complication, can be very successful. It, usually, it's in mares to be brood mares or stallions, but I've also fused pets. You know, p- the people that just, you know, they they the, the meaningful horse. So, this is the injury that Ruffian suffered from. But but the, Dr. Bramlage developed this technique. It's been used a lot, um, uh, but I'd say seventy to seventy five percent in the in the last study um, survived. So, and they, and they do great. Like, like you said, yeah. they, they are very functional, yeah. very happy out in the field. Yeah, and the other reason we do is just like I showed the pastern is for arthritic changes, and, and, and the major reason is, is, is that because the mares aren't, aren't fertile they, they, because they're in pain. Pain, yeah. And, and I, I remember how to conv- I've convinced a few clients uh, that, well, she won't get, you know, she's not pregnant, so should we do it? And I said, she's not pregnant because of this. Right, uh, you know, if she's you, so usually this solves that yeah that problem. They often get I don't know how many, I mean Bart usually after just a couple of cycles, right? Once yeah. you make them comfortable, comfortable. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horses, horses are good at self preservation, right? Yeah, they don't need another organism on <laughs> on board if they're not comfortable, right? Yeah. Right. Well, re- reproduction's a luxury, as they say, and mm-hmm. yeah, that's, right. It's one of the first things to go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and protects the other limb on the other side, right? If they if they're comfortable on that one, they're not going to overload the other one. Co- correct. And that, you've got. Then you've got potential for four good limbs instead of only two, and they exactly. can't last on that. Right, and we re- and we work like a horse like this. This surgery, I would always consult with um, our call podiatry. I mean, it's not a consult because everyone knows what we're going to do, and we put a protective shoe on the other foot while they're under anesthesia, usually in recovery, um, so that the limbs are equal because she'll be in a cast for a while. So mm-hmm. the casted limb will be slightly longer. That means they'll be putting more weight on the shorter leg. Um, and we use special shoeing, and that's just done routinely. And it's not a soft ride. People think soft rides are the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're to protect the hoof wall while you're waiting to do something else. So there's different techniques, cuff shoes with uh, impression material underneath it that we use that our podiatry group is really good at putting on. And we do that for all, all these cases. And it's, it's, very, it's very successful to prevent laminitis. Occasionally, you'll have horses with subclinical laminitis already, and, and they'll have problems really quickly that, you know, you can't, you can't change the deal. You can only play the cards that you got, mm-hmm. right? And so and you don't always know what's, that's happening. So um, this, this fold, like just going up the leg, this is the radius, right? And so um, this is from the archives. This is a little old. This is a, one of our good clients when they first moved here. Um, and has this transverse fracture of the, of the radius, and you can see double-plated, the same kind of idea we've done with the others. 
um, different types of screws in this young full. This is before the locking plate. I had to use these. These really look like lag screws. They're not, they're very weak screws, but the bone was soft here and I couldn't get the, the cortex screws to, to, to um, catch. So I use these, uh, they're called cancellous screws because this part of the bone has more cancellous bone, which is spongier bone than the dense bone, the cortical bone. So, and this is this, my last slide, just some exotics for you. This is a, uh, one of our clients also does rehab and wanted me to put a transficial bridge in this fawn that they had because uh, of angular deformity. But the, when, when they sent it over, I said, wait, <laughs> I said, well, send it over. <laughs> and I said, no, it's, it does have an angular deformity. It's from a, a malaligned radial Refresh fracture. Yeah. Um, so fortunately, I have a good relationship with the, the, these. Is, this is a 2.7 set. We don't own a 2.7 set because we're not going to do too many fawns or small animals. But I was able to call the, uh, the manufacturer, the supplier, and they sent me a, a, a set to use and they donated the, the, the implants. And so we did a, what's called a step osteotomy. We cut the, I cut the leg in a, in a way to straighten it out. Um, uh, came, so it came back the next week when I had the equipment and that's what it looked like. And, and I was at a challenge cause I don't know how knock knee you make a fawn. I saw Bambi, but I wasn't clear. So I had a, uh, uh, anyway, you can see this is the, this is the good leg. This is a one X-ray on the bad leg. So it's not perfect, but this, it was perfect because this fawn did really well. Yeah, mm -hmm. Um, and then this is a, this is a, a cat. I was up teaching a course in Columbus, uh, our internal fixation course. And I got a call from a veterinarian at the Memphis Zoo about a, a six day old giraffe that broke, had broken its leg or its mom had just like in horses, his mom stepped on it. You know, I mean, we, we've all been through this and they wanted to fix it. So I said, sure. I, and I called our anesthesiologist, Dr. Hubble. And I said, John, can we anesthetize a giraffe? And John worked for Ohio State forever and was always doing stuff at the Columbus Zoo. So I knew he'd be comfortable with it, but I just like before they sent it. And he said, sure. And then I called uh, Dr. Barr because I didn't want the giraffe mixed in with the general population because I, you know, who knows what microorganisms could bring in. So we, we have a separate building that we have one stall in that doesn't interact with anything. So that's where the, where the, 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 the draft was going to go. The calf was going to go. And then my only stipulation was they had to send people because our staff wasn't going to be, we didn't, I didn't want them in. I didn't want them mingling with horses mm -hmm. and I didn't want, I don't know anything about, I don't know about you, Peter. How, your giraffe medicine is probably not super high. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, it's I mean, better than most. They're, they're, they're impressive on television from a distance. Yeah, they yeah, look really yeah, good. Exactly. So I would they sent a, a, a team giraffe up, and uh, Dr. Knightley, their veterinarian, came up as well. One of the interesting things about this, so it's bone's bone, and you know, this is like a uh, obviously the it, it, it's uh, it's cloven hoof, so it's it's like a, a calf. Mm -hmm. um, it is a calf, but it's like a, a bovine calf. Uh, we use that special plate uh, that we developed in, in horses, and the company, uh, Depew Synthase, donated the materials. Um, so they replenished our, our materials, and we did the secondary plate uh, here and the long plate on the outside. Um, the um, Yeah, we, the, the calf was here about six days, went back to Memphis. That's the, This is me, and that's, a, that's the draft. They, they named my, my tech at the time. Uh, was Alex and my intern was Allie and this her name was Ariana the 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 uh, calf but they changed her name to Allie and named mm. after all of us and that was nice and this is her I was like two and a half years of age so they grow up so fast that was that's kind of cuddly for you yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... well I'm better with animals than people yeah. Bart. I think that's I think that's well known yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway and this was Ranger that was the name of this uh, so anyway just some cool things that. Uh, you get to do every now and again. One of the weird thing, I, I, so when we anesthetize it, Dr. Knightley from she was kept holding the cap, the calf's neck straight. And I guess if they will, they will get like permanent torn mm -hmm. pulses if if you're not holding yep. it and in recovery too. So her, you know, because she came up and we, you know, I, I was like, I'll do the leg, but I like I said, I don't really know anything about giraffes, and uh, uh, but that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. but, but she didn't get. Because I guess they get a real, a real crick. It's a big neck. Um, anyway, so yeah. that's everything I know. Well, Al, that was a fascinating walk through the science of fracture repair. But you've really impressed us on the art, because this is, yeah, I mean, it's um, the material science, um, the knowledge of the bone, but there's also a lot of art involved in putting everything in the right place and putting together a plan to get success. I mean, this is just not stuff you can cookbook. 
you've got to think through every right. case and every case is different. And that's the thing that's really impressed us. There's a great variety of things that you've shown us and just a multitude of approaches to actually get to the repair. So this has been a great episode. Yeah, has, I, I just have one more quote. What's, what, you talked about the Arth, Fetlock Arthrodesis, but what do you would just say, what are the other big changes that you've seen in your career? Well, I, I think the fixed angle plate is, is a big deal. Uh, the other big thing is people understand now, or surgeons understand that we don't need to protect horses and casts. Like, look, the morbidity in a, in a foal by putting them in a cast for too long, meaning the weakening of the soft tissue structure is really important. So we have to have faith in our, our rigid repairs that we are making them comfortable. Yeah. And so you have to manage, you, you got to get over, I just want the x-ray to look good, right? Like when you're young, starting, you're so paranoid that someone's going to see a mistake, right? I mean, it's just natural. But you're not thinking about the long-term outcome. Right, mm -hmm. and so some, and so you get this. Hopefully, this experience. Um, uh, what experience is the name I gave to my mistakes or something? But mm -hmm. um, the where you're, you have to have confidence in what you're doing, and you start managing the whole patient from a long term aspect. And I think that as a group, we've done pretty well uh, with that. You know, we teach these courses every year, um, or sometimes more than once a year. Uh, residents come, and that we try to impart all the. You know, you have to. It's it's more than just what the what the film looks like. Yeah, you know, and imaging is a big difference too. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and our imaging does just keep getting better and better. Right? Yeah. So. Al, thanks for coming in today. Yeah, sure, no problem. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it, and thanks for it thanks fun. for everything. All right. Yeah. And that was stall side for this week. We've been talking to Dr. Al Ruggles of Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital about his approaches to fracture repair in horses. See you next time. <laughs>